With that in mind, this might be an excellent time to shoot her. But she's heard something. Not me, because her head turns away, toward the drop-off, and she sprints for the woods. I wait. No one. Nothing shows up. Still, if Fox they thought it was dangerous, maybe it's time for me to get out of here, too. Besides, I'm eager to tell Rue about the pyramid. Since I have no idea where the careers are, the route back by the stream seems as good as any. I hurry, loaded bow in one hand, a hunk of co cold grusling in the other, because I'm famished now, and not just for leaves and berries, but for the fat and protein in the meat. The trip to the stream is uneventful. Once there, I refill my water and wash, taking particular care with my injured ear. Then I travel uphill using the stream as a guide. At one point, I find boot prints in the mud along the bank. The careers have been here, but not for a while. The prints are deep because they were made in soft mud, but now they're nearly dry in the hot sun. I haven't been careful enough in my own tracks, counting on a light tread in the pine needles to conceal my prints. Now I strip off my boots and socks and go barefoot up the bed of the stream. The cool water has an invigorating effect on my body, my spirits. I shoot two fish, easy pickings in the shallow moving stream, and go ahead and eat one raw, even though I've just had the grusling. The second I'll save for Rue. Gradually, subtly, the ringing in my right ear diminishes until it's gone entirely. I find myself pawing at my left ear, periodically, trying to clean away whatever deadens its ability to collect sounds. If there's improvement, it's undetectable. I can't, I can't just adjust to deafness in the ear. It makes me feel off balance and defenseless to my left, blind even. My head keeps turning to the injured side, as my right ear tries to compensate for the wall of nothingness where yesterday there was a constant flow of information. The more time that passes, the less hopeful I am that this is an injury that will heal. When I reach the site of our first meeting, I feel, un I feel certain it's been undisturbed. There's no sign of Rue, not on the ground or in the trees. This is odd. By now she should have returned as it's midday. Undoubtedly, she spent the night in a tree somewhere. What else could she do with no light in the careers with her night vision glasses tromping around the woods? And the third fire she was supposed to set, although I forgot to check for it last night, was the farthest from our sight of all. She's probably just being cautious about making her way back. I wish she'd hurry, because I don't want to hang around here too long. I want to spend the afternoon traveling to higher ground, hunting as we go. But there's nothing really for me to do but wait. I wash the blood out of my jacket and hair, and clean my ever-growing list of wounds. The burns are much better, but I use a bit of medicine on them anyway. The main thing to worry about now is keeping out infection. I go ahead and eat the second fish. It isn't going to last long in this hot sun, but it should be easy enough to spear for m more for Rue if she would just show up. Feeling too vulnerable on the ground with my lopsided hearing, I scale a tree to wait. If the careers show up, this will be a fine place to shoot them from. The sun moves slowly. I do things to pass the time, chew leaves and apply them to my stings that are deflated but still tender come through my damp hair with my fingers and braid it, place my boots back up, check over my bow and remaining nine arrows, test my left ear repeatedly for signs of life by rustling a leaf near it, but without good results. Despite the grusling and the fish, my stomach's growling, and I know I'm going to have what we call a hollow day back in District 12. That's a day where no matter what you put in your belly, it's never enough. Having nothing to do but sit in a tree makes it worse, so I decide to give in to it. After all, I've lost a lot of weight in the arena. I need some extra calories, and having the bow and arrows makes me far more confident about my future prospects. I slowly peel and eat a handful of nuts, my last cracker, the grusling neck. That's good, because it takes time to pick clean. Finally, a grusling wing and the bird is history, but it's a hollow day, and even with all that I start daydreaming about food particularly the, the de decanate dishes served in the capital. The chicken and creamy orange sauce, the cakes and pudding, bread with butter, noodles and green sauce, the lamb and dried plum stew. 
I suck on a few mint leaves and tell myself to get over it. Mint is good because we drink mint tea after supper often, so it tricks my stomach into thinking eating time is over. Sort of. Dangling up in the tree, with the sun warming me, a mouthful of mint, my bow and arrows at hand. This is the most relaxed I've been since I've entered the arena. If only Rue would show up and we could clear out. As the shadows grow, so does my restlessness. By late afternoon, I've resolved to go looking for her. I can't at least visit the spot where she set the third fire and see if there are any clues to her whereabouts. Before I go, I scatter a few mint leaves around our old campfire. Since we gather these some distance away, Rue will understand I've been here, while they'll mean nothing to the careers. In less than an hour, I'm at the place where we agreed to have the third fire. I now know something has gone amiss. The wood has been neatly arranged, expertly in interspersed with tinder, with tinder, but it has never been lit. Rue set up the fire, but never made it back here. Somewhere between the second column of smoke I spied before I blew up the supplies and this point, she ran into trouble. I have to remind myself she's still alive, or is she? Could the cannon shot have announced her death have come in the wee hours of the morning when even my good ear was too broken to pick it up? Will she appear in the sky tonight? No, I refuse to believe it. There could be a hundred other explanations. Explanations. She could have lost her way, run to a pack of predators or another tribute, like Thresh, and had to hide. Whatever happened, I'm almost certain she's stuck out there, somewhere between the second fire and the unlit one at my feet. Something is keeping her up a tree. I think I'll go hunt it down. It's a relief to be doing something after sitting around all afternoon. I creep silently through the shadows, letting them conceal me, but nothing seems suspicious. There's no sign of any kind of struggle, no disruption of the needles on the ground. I've stopped just for a moment when I hear it. I have to cock my head around to the side to be sure, but there it is again. Whose four-note tune coming out of a Mockingjay's mouth, the one that means she's all right. I grin and move in the direction of the bird. Another, just a short distance ahead, picks up on the handful of notes. Rue has been singing to them, and recently. Otherwise, they'd have taken up some other song. My eyes lift up into the trees, searching for a sign of her. I shallow and sing softly back, hoping she'll know it's safe to join me. A Mockingjay repeats the melody to me, and that's when I hear the scream. It's a child's scream, a young girl's scream. There's no one in the arena capable of making that sound except Rue. And now I'm running, knowing this may be a trap, knowing three careers may be poised to attack me. But I can't help myself. There's another high-pitched cry, this time my name. Katniss! Katniss! Rue! I shout back, so she knows I'm near. So they know I'm near. And hopefully, the girl who has attacked them with tracker jackers and gotten an eleven they still can't explain will be enough to pull their attention away. Rue, I'm coming! When I break into the clearing, she's on the ground, hopelessly entangled in a net. She just has time to reach her hand through the mesh and say my name before the spear enters her body. Chapter 18 the boy from District 1 dies before he can pull out the spear. My arrow drives directly into the center of his neck. He falls to his knees and halves the brief remainder of his life by yanking out the arrow and drowning in his own blood. I'm reloaded, shifting my aim from side to side while I shout at Rue, Are there more? Are there more? She has to say no several times before I hear it. Rue is rolled to her side, her body curved in, her, in and around the spear. I shove the boy away from her and pull out my knife, freeing her from the net. One look at the wound, and I know it's far beyond my capacity to heal, beyond anyone's probably. The spearhead is buried deep up to the shaft in her stomach. I crouch before her, staring helplessly at the embedded weapon. There's no point in comforting words and in telling her she'll be alright. She's no fool. 
Her hand reaches out, and I clutch it like a lifeline. As if it's me who's dying instead of Rue. You blew up the food? She whispers. Every last bit, I say. You have to win, she says. I'm going to. Going to win for both of us now. I promise. I hear a cannon and look up. It must be for the boy from District 1. Don't go! Rue tightens her grip on my hand. Of course not. Staying right here, I say. I move in closer to her, pulling her head onto my lap. I gently brush the dark, thick hair back behind her ear. Sing, she says, but I barely catch the word. Sing, I think. Sing what? I do know a few songs, believe it or not. There was once music in my house, too. Music I helped make. My father pulled me in with that remarkable voice. But I haven't sung much since he died, except when Prim is very sick. Then I sing her the same song she liked as a baby. <laughs> sing. My throat is tight with tears, hoarse from smoke and fatigue. But if this is Prim's, I mean, Rue's last request, I have to at least try. The song that comes to me is a, sim is a simple lullaby. One we sing fretful, hungry babies to sleep with. It's old. Very old, I think. Made up long ago in our hills. What my music teacher calls a mountain air. But the words are easy and soothing. Promising tomorrow will be more hopeful than this awful piece of time we call today. I give a small cough. Swallow hard. Deep in the meadow under the willow, a bed of grass, a soft green pillow. Lay down your head and close your sleepy eyes. And when again they open, the sun will rise. Hear it sing. Hear warm. Hear the daisies guard you from every harm. Hear your dreams are sweet and tomorrow brings them true. Here is the place where I love you. Rue's eyes have fluttered shut. Her chest moves, but only slightly. My throat releases the tears, and they slide down my cheeks. But I have to finish the song for her. Deep in the meadow, hidden far away, A cloak of leaves, a moonbeam ray. Forget your woes and let your troubles lay. And when it's morning, they'll wash away. Hear it safe, hear it's warm. Hear the daisies guard you from every harm. The final lines are barely audible. Hear your dreams are sweet. And tomorrow brings them true. Here is the place where I love you. Everything's still and quiet. Then, almost eerily, the mocking jays take up my song. For a moment, I sit there, watching my tears drip down on her face. Ruth's cannon fires. I lean forward and press my lips against her temple. Slowly, as if not to wake her, I lay her head back on the ground and release her hand. They'll want me to clear out now, so they can collect the bodies, and there's nothing to stay for. I roll the boy from District 1 onto his face and take his pack, retrieve the arrow that ended his life. 